Great. Welcome, everybody. I'm Bobby Duffy. I'm chair of the Campaign for Social Science, and it is a real pleasure for me to welcome you to the Campaign for Social Science Annual SAGE Lecture 2022 from Torsten Bell. Um, the Annual SAGE Lecture is a, a flagship event in the campaign's calendar, uh, and this one could, just couldn't be more topical, um, focused as it is on the cost of living crisis from both a short-term and a long-term perspective, as Torsten will talk us through. Uh, for anyone who doesn't know, the Campaign for Social Science is a key part of the Academy of Social Sciences, um, and we've been set up to demonstrate, not just tell people, but demonstrate just how important the social sciences are uh, to improving decision making, society and lives. And those skills, expertise and evidence, a lot of which we'll see today, just couldn't be more important in helping us chart our way through this, this really tough uh, long term economic situation. Um, the campaign is supported by 33 universities, and we're hugely grateful for that um, support. And the numbers are growing all the time. There's been a real uplift in interest and engagement as our activity grows, uh, all under the excellent stewardship uh, from the Academy in our president, Will Hutton, and chief exec, Rita Gardner. Um, and of course, we're also hugely grateful for the support from SAGE Publishing, who sponsor this event, but are also excellent partners um, to so much of our activity. And uh, we're going to hear from Katie Metzler, who's Vice President for Books and Social Science Innovation, in just a couple of minutes. Um, uh, and so all of these supporters allow us to complete all sorts of work um, uh, in different sorts of spheres, but not least built around our three hubs on key themes, um, on uh, one COVID, uh, COVID recovery, one on climate and sustainability, and then one on living standards and leveling up. And Steve, our excellent uh, campaign manager, Steve Grundy, is going to put a link into the chat, uh, which uh, to link to some of those hubs, which uh, showcase how social science is making a real difference on these uh, major issues. Um, so before I hand over to Katie, I'm just going to briefly introduce Torsten, who'll be known to all of you, I'm guessing. He's been in the media all over the place uh, in the past uh, week or so. Uh, and, and brilliant analysis from Resolution Foundation um, in response to the autumn statement. Um, Torsten is, of course, Chief Executive of the Resolution Foundation. Prior to that, he was Director of Policy for the Labour Party, also worked in, in the Treasury as a member of the Council of Economic Advisors during the financial crisis and as a civil servant. He's a trustee of Child Poverty Action Group and, of course, a fellow of the Academy of Social Sciences, uh, which is great. Um, and we're very lucky to have Torsten here. Uh, because he had a last minute invitation to appear at a Treasury Select Committee this PM, but he's sticking with us. He's prioritised us for today, which is awesome. Um, uh, but it shows how on topic uh, the lecture is this year and, and how great our lineup uh, is and, and was. We, we had Linda Yu, uh, who was due to respond to Torsten's lecture. Uh, and she's also now appearing at the Treasury um, Select Committee. Um, but we're delighted and extremely grateful to have two really excellent um, replacements for Linda. Uh, we've got uh, Shreya Nanda, who from December will be Chief Economist at the Social Market Foundation. Um, and Shreya was until very recently an economist at IPPR, has uh, expertise in a range of really relevant policy areas for today on tax, housing and wealth inequality. And uh, we've also got Aaron Advani, who is Associate Professor in Economics Department at the University of Warwick, also a research fellow at the Institute of Fiscal Studies, and an expert in issues relating to inequality, tax compliance, tax design, uh, with a focus on those with high incomes or wealth, and uh, non -dom, including non-DOMs, which is very topical uh, right now. Um, after responses from our panelists, there'll be time for questions um, from the audience. So do use the Q&A function, get in early. Uh, there is an upvoting function within that, which is really helpful, makes my job much easier as chair. So do uh, engage with the questions uh, and look forward to seeing those as they come in. Uh, but let's get straight over to Katie, who can uh, hand us on to Torsten. Katie. Thank you, Bobby. And yes, welcome everyone to SAGE and the campaign's annual lecture. This uh, lecture series aims to demonstrate the ways that social science can help us understand and tackle the problems we're facing as a country and as a society. And there certainly has been no shortage of problems to choose from this year. As we've hurtled from one crisis to the next, um, the role of academics and think tanks in providing rigorous high quality analysis has never felt so important. And the Resolution Foundation has really stood out as 
as a provider of really timely insights and analysis for policymakers and the public on the cost of living crisis, which I know for many, many people in the UK has become the primary concern heading into winter. I've lost track of the number of articles I've read this week alone that reference Torsten or the Foundation's work and evidence. So this feels like the perfect speaker and topic to demonstrate how the use of social science research data and evidence can improve public policy, society, and all of our lives. Um, at, at SAGE, we're really passionate supporters of the Campaign for Social Science, who work, whose work aligns very closely with SAGE's mission to build bridges to knowledge. And at SAGE, we're free to support important causes like the campaign and to put on events like this one, in part because of our unique founder, Sarah Miller McCune, who started SAGE when she was 24 and who has recently passed control of the company to an independent trust charged with maintaining our independence and mission for the long term. So what this means is that a selection of universities and charitable organizations that support social justice initiatives will become SAGE's beneficial owners. And by transferring control of SAGE publishing to a trust, Sarah has secured our independence, and that means we're free to pursue our mission and our academic goals for decades to come. And if this decade continues as it started, we in the social sciences have plenty of work ahead of us. So I'm really looking forward to learning from our excellent speakers tonight. And with that, I'll hand over to Torsten Bell, our keynote speaker for this evening. Great, thank you very much indeed. Katie M for that update. And uh, I didn't actually realize you got that far in the uh, future of SAGE. That's really interesting to um, hear. I should start by saying thank you very much indeed to. Bobby and Steve and everyone at um, the campaign and the academy for the invitation. It's very great to be here. Having been in the audience listening to several of these lectures over the years, it's good to, um, even if still remotely, uh, but it's good to be um, talking to you all uh, today. Um, I mean, in lots of ways, the last few years running, as Katie was saying, from pandemics through to energy crises and then back into another recession should hopefully mean that you don't need a campaign to remind people that social sciences matter, but it turns out you do because there's been not everybody has been as enthusiastic uh, about social science all through that phase. So that is really um, it's very important as a campaign, and we're obviously very happy to support it. The Resolution Foundation, you're our top campaign because someone needs to uh, uh, do so. For those that don't know us, um, the Resolution Foundation is a small, independent, non-partisan think tank focused on raising the living standards of those on low to middle incomes. All of the work that um, Bobby and Katie were being very kind about just now is obviously done by the hardworking team rather than me, and they're the ones that deserve all the credit. And most of what I'm about to cover you and show you in terms of the lecture also draws on their work. So I should say thank you very much indeed uh, to them for everything they do, including last week not getting a lot of sleep uh, while we tried to inform the discussion about the autumn statement while it was um, going on. Now, um, in terms of what I thought I would cover, I'm going to try and bring some slides up and then we shall get going. Um, on, here we go, using the wonders of modern IT. Bobby, if you nod, then I'll know. Also, yes, got some slides. Very good. This is the first sign of success. The um, actual science is working, even if the social science isn't. The, um, right, so I'm going to cover um, uh, three things uh, in the course of this afternoon, just to give you a heads up on what those are. are. The, um, so the first is, is the obvious, which is I'm going to cover the cost of living crisis as Britain is experiencing it, and particularly low middle income Britain is experiencing it at the hard end this winter. Then I then want to reflect a bit on the long and winding road, you see what we did there, um, that has brought us to this point, with, with one particular question in mind, which is why, why does this cost of living crisis feel so hard in Britain? It's not our first one, it is a very deep one, but why does it feel so hard for Britain in the 2020s? And what does that tell us when we step back about the, the successes or failures of 21st century um, uh, Britain and our economy and who it works for. And then lastly, and in a more risky way, I thought we should have a bit of a therapy session in the sense, not all therapy and not as expensive as most therapy is, I promise, but I thought we should reflect a bit on, a bit of self-reflection on what, how have we done as social sciences, so, social scientists particularly those involved in economic policy, which is obviously the bit of the world that we inhabit. How have we done over the course of the last few decades in a country that was facing this short term cost of living crisis, but also as I'll go on to outline some longer term challenges that we haven't proven able to overcome. So that is vaguely what you are going to get. And then we'll have a time for uh, Aaron and um, Sharia and then for discussion about hopefully along those times those issues. So that's what you're going to get. Hopefully that's a good agenda to keep us through the next 40 minutes or so. The, um, so first of all, we're going to start from where basically every discussion 
in both policy making at the moment, but also, to be honest, in life at the moment. You don't have to go very far talking to anybody, even if they're not involved in the kind of things that um, some of us do professionally. Everybody's worried about their energy bill. Everybody's worried about filling up the car. Lots of people are worried about the rising cost of food. So I thought we should, we're going to start there before we move on to some of the longer term trends. The, um, so the first thing I thought I wanted to reflect on is I often sometimes get asked, oh, you know, should we be calling it a cost of living crisis? The word crisis, you know, maybe that's too loaded, uh, scares people. Uh, and or, you know, is it that unusual, really, what's going on? So this is, first of all, a chart um, reflecting the Office for Budget Responsibilities uh, disposable incomes forecast from last week. So this is brand new from last Thursday. It's showing you the growth in those income per, income per person. And if you focus on the two red bars on the right hand side, what they're telling you is that the income fall over this year and next, so 23, 24, up to the end of 23, 24, is much larger than the incomes falls we've seen at any point in the last half century. They're so large, between them we're talking 7% of uh, incomes, that's about £1,700 per household, and they are the kind of falls that you would only normally expect to see in a very, very deep recession, i.e. not of the kind that we've seen. And even if you look at the financial crisis, this is much worse than the income falls during the financial crisis. So I think calling it a crisis is completely legitimate. Um, and in fact, not doing so is in danger. Uh, this definitely I saw happening. We started writing in these terms uh, about this time last year in the run up to Christmas, looking ahead to what was going to be a very difficult year this year as energy prices rose. Um, some people over the over the first six months of last year, I think, were slow to realise how bad this was going to be. And policy took a long time to catch up. So I think recognising how bad this is, is the first step in a decent policy response to it. The, um, now, obviously, the main manifestation of that is the highest inflation we've seen in 40 years. Without going through the different measures of inflation on any measure, this is exceptionally high. It also, I mean, I haven't got it here, but this it's also the fastest rate of increase that we've seen in 40 years. And the majority of it obviously came as a significant surprise to almost all forecasters and commentators. If you go back to um, the beginning of 2021, people were much more worried about deflation than they were about surging inflation so i think there are as i'll come back to later lessons for all of us um in that but you know, that's the big underpinning picture that's driving this now what is that made up of now lots of you already know this but so i won't labor the point but on the blue bars we're showing the contribution from petrol prices and energy bills the um, which is very very significant to that inflation on that the only thing i would highlight given that lots of those not lots of those doing social science in britain but lots of those doing social science directly in government policy making are London focused oh, and if they're not London focused they're city focused so I think it is important to highlight that the petrol prices bit of this has eased a bit over the summer but is a very large part of what is going on and you were having this if you were having this conversation in the United States of America then what they would call gas prices would be a very large part of the conversation and for some households is a really really big deal then um, now within that though uh, under that headline if you look at what's going on with goods prices you can see a very very large contribution to what we're seeing now some of that is obviously second round effects of energy costs pushing up the cost of producing those goods but it isn't just that it's also because it turns out that americans will buy almost inexhaustible amounts of every single good that's globally traded over the course of the last two years like computer equipment uh musical equipment sports equipment a lot is being sucked in to a very high demand u.s market and that is combining with supply co supply constraints particularly from asia into driving up global goods prices and that's a lot of so it's not to do with uk demand particularly being high it's to do with demand being very high in the united states and these being globally traded goods so this is a global uh trend going on two different kinds of things but both of which manifest themselves as um supply shocks to the uk economy which is more expensive and in terms of trade shock which means we're poorer as a country because the things we import are more expensive than the things we produce and we don't produce a lot of goods and you'll have noticed we don't produce a lot of gas uh these days so that's what's a, as a short summary of what is uh driving this now as i said at the beginning obviously this is very bad indeed for everybody this phase of high inflation even just the energy bills on their own would be a huge shock to our household incomes this chart though is just one way of thinking about why this is so much more difficult for those on lower incomes than your average inflation shock. So this is showing you the difference between the inflation rates experienced by those on 
the lowest income and those on the highest incomes. And in general, if you look over the last six years pre-pandemic, there aren't large differences in the inflation rates experienced by different those different groups. But right now, we've got record differences going on. And that is because I mean, and they're very large. So double digit inflation for everybody, but you know, 12, 13% inflation for those on the lowest incomes. That's because energy and food, and I think food is probably under discussed, it's definitely under discussed because globally, the food price issue is nearly as big as the energy price issue. If you're in a developing country, the food price issue is probably a bigger issue for your country right now. But the, but food and energy are two things which lower income households can, is a bigger part of their consumption basket than higher income households. And that is driving overwhelmingly the higher inflation faced by these groups. Petrol prices are actually a bigger deal for higher income groups. They drive more. It's a bigger part of their consumption basket. But the, um, so that is that is to some degree uh, reducing the size of the gap. But overall, food and energy is dominating. If you look back over history, you can see two phases where similar trends were going on. If you look just before the financial crisis in 2008-9, that's the last food price shock we had. Uh, if those of you that were around at the time, that's when we were all panicking about rice being hoarded uh, around the world. The, um, I can remember Gordon Brown saying, you know, what are we going to do about the rice traders? Uh, in various, and the answer is nothing, um, I'm afraid. But the, um, And then if you look after the financial crisis, you can see the last energy price shock working its way through the system between around 2012. Them. So you, you do get these, but the scale of what's going on now is much worse for lower income households. For exactly the same reason, uh, older people are seeing higher inflation rates right now, almost all driven by the fact that energy is a bigger problem uh, for their consumption baskets without going into all the weeds. And in general, we don't see, we don't generally see very different inflation rates by age. So this is quite an unusual feat. This comes from our annual intergenerational audit published last uh, week. And if you're not reading Bobby Duffy's excellent work on all things generational, should have already done so. Uh, but anyway, this is our contribution to that um, discussion. Now, when there are, there's a, there are some, although not as many as I would like, timely surveys of how people are coping with this crisis. The ONS, to be fair, has increasingly started trying to fill in gaps in this area. So I'm just going to show you one slide from there, um, one, from one of their surveys they do. This is showing you um, how what percentage of people on different uh, personal incomes, so not household income, personal incomes, are finding it difficult to pay their energy bills? And there's two things to draw out. One is lots of every income group are finding it difficult. So even amongst the richest group, we're still talking about a quarter of people finding it difficult. And I think when you talk about energy bills that we were used to being, you know, £1,200 being 2500 since October, you can see why even someone on quite a high income, if they didn't have much disposable income, would find that difficult. But there is clearly a very steep gradient by income, twice as likely to find it difficult to pay if you are lower incomes. And if I showed you lots of other slides that for this survey, you can um, you can see people, particularly those on lower incomes, already if that as early as September, saying they were taking quite drastic actions to cut back on other areas of um, uh, spending, and not just on energy, cutting back on almost all spending. And that obviously is what, half of the reason you end up in a recession in an energy price shock is that consumers cut back on all other spending. The other half is that lots of production becomes unprofitable when energy prices are high. Now, what does that feed through to? Well, because this energy price shock is happening to a country that happens to have a tight labor market at the same time, you're getting two things going on, which we're not used to seeing. The first is actually, by historical standards, quite high wage growth, nominal wage growth, so folks on the purple line. But that's happening at the same time as inflation is heading towards 40-year um, uh, highs. So real wages are also seeing near record falls, which is what the yellow bars at the bottom are showing you. So that is a, that's an unusual thing. And that's why it's both true what the, what, the, what the Bank of England says, which is we're nervous about the strength of wage growth, and what the TUC says, which is wage growth is a disaster. And both are right, and for different reasons. Um, uh, and we have to have, I think it's really important we hold both of those in our heads. There is a very, very big distinction if I split that purple line out by the public and the private sector right now. Private sector wage growth is you know, very, very strong, over 7% right now. The public sector is near a 2%. And that scale of gap between the public and private sectors is certainly not sustainable for any prolonged period of time because you can set whatever public sector wage policy you like. But unfortunately, we're a liberal enough country that people can leave those jobs, which is why you're seeing vacancies in the public sector continuing to grow, even though private sector vacancies have now turned the corner and are now falling. 
Um, right. I, I then think it's good to think through the phases of this crisis as they may develop. So I've done the price push part of this, the, um, and we'll see how that develops in the years ahead, but we're probably already heading towards the peak on the prices side. This is then saying, what does that mean for the labour market looking ahead rather than the wages people are seeing right now? And this is showing you forecasts for unemployment. The green line, line is showing you that the OBR expected basically zero growth in unemployment back in March. Since then, we've had they, they and the Bank of England have updated their inflation forecasts, their unemployment forecast, sorry. And because they're both expecting a recession over the course of the next 18 months or two years, if you're the Bank of England, then we are set for a rise in unemployment that takes us in, in the Bank of England's case well above the pandemic peak that we saw when furlough kept the peak of unemployment down. Um, to put those into numbers, because, you know, on historical levels, these aren't high levels of unemployment for a recession, but it's quite a shallow recession. So in numbers, this is 500,000 jobs on going on the OBR's numbers, and it's nearer a million on the Bank of England's numbers. So for those people, the cost of living crisis becomes a much more acute thing because energy prices shared across the population, harder to deal with at the bottom. But for unemployment, it's a much more acute personalized part of the cost of living crunch and the other one of those which has a very you know acute effect but on a subset of the population is what interest rates are going to be doing to mortgages the, um, now again go back a year ago and nobody would have believed you that the bank of england would be having interest rates three three percent plus but that is where we find ourselves today so this is drawing from some modeling we've done taking the fact that you don't see uh, interest rates feeding through into higher mortgage rates overnight in Britain anymore, partly because there's fewer people with mortgages, but mainly because those that have mortgages are now on fixed term mortgages rather than on variable rates. So it's more what you see is over time, higher interest rates feeding through as people flow off those fixed rate mortgages onto their new mortgage products. And as that happens, they, they are inheriting a higher monthly payment. So this is showing you what our modelling suggests will be the increase between basically uh, September September this year and the end of 2026, by which time we'll have seen five or six million people flow on to more expensive mortgages, households, I should say, and then the average increase in their mortgage bills. Now, this is the average increase of mortgager households across the age distribution. So for those affected, the numbers are higher than this. This is the average effect on a mortgager household of different age cohorts. And what you can see is that basically you didn't want to be a young person that recently bought your property because in the end, some young people will win from rising interest rates because they should all else equal need to house price falls, fairly significant ones if interest rates settle around 4%. And, then, and therefore, yes, you'll have to pay the higher interest rate, but the amount of capital you're paying that on is lower. But for those that have bought in at those high house prices and now face those highest rates, they are the biggest losers from what is going on in terms of their mortgage payments obviously those on those older households who have more expensive properties could lose more in terms of the house price losses but i'm just illustrating i think it's worth just keeping the scale of this is quite staggering so yes this is a subset of the richer parts of these cohorts but people in their late 20s you know they they may well not be earning more than thirty thousand pounds you know if they've had to inherit some money to pay for to get on that housing ladder then they could see their mortgage rise by five thousand pounds in the course of the next few years Right, then let's just do two brief slides on uh, where we are on the government's policy response after the autumn statement last week. So first of all, and I'll do this in two chunks, what are, what's the government doing to support households with energy bills next year? And then what are they doing in terms of putting up taxes in the medium term? So this is showing you across the income distribution, poorer households on the left, richer households on the right, the support provided in um, blue, which is this year, in particular this winter, and remember it's winters that matter for energy bills in particular, and then it's the support they're currently planning to provide next year in red. Now, the support in red is being delivered via two mechanisms, an energy price guarantee, that's the Liz Trust policy, but where the level of generosity is being cut so that it only kicks in as a cap at £3,000 in terms of the typical household bill rather than the current £2,500. And then a more generous version of Rishi Sunak's cost of living payments. Those are the lump sum payments to vulnerable groups, for example, £900 to those on means tested benefits. So there's two things to take away from this chart. One is the level of support is much less generous next year than this year. We are being weaned off government support. The amount of remember, the big picture here is we're deciding how the country gets poorer. And here we're deciding that next year, that households will get poorer rather than the public sector balance sheet sucking that up in the face of the energy price shock. So it's significantly less. It's about a 60% cut in the level of support 
this year to next. That, that's, for example, you won't get the £400 discount from energy bills next year, you won't get a council tax rebate, and you won't get the lower level of the energy price guarantee. But it is more progressive next year than this year because the, those cost of living payments are doing more of the work. Um, and so you can see that two thirds of the support next year goes to the bottom half of the population. Whereas last year, actually, it's only actually about half that goes to the bottom half of the, um, of the population. So more progressive, but less of it, basically, is the big picture of what's happening next year. I have to say, if energy bills stay above £3,000, they're currently forecast to be about 3300 on average next year, it's going to be a very difficult year. You're basically asking people to deal with three times the energy bill that they are used to. And unless they happen to be on a means-tested benefit, and remember, four in 10 of those on the lowest incomes aren't on means-tested benefits, they're going to find that very hard to deal with indeed. Uh, right, then we go to the takeaway. What is the government doing the opposite? So there's a lot of policy measures going on here. But really, the big picture is that the, the, the never-ending freezes to tax thresholds, every single bit of the tax system has now been frozen, basically. There's no, the fiscal drag is happening, self-taxes, fiscal drag, whatever you wish to call it, is happening across the entire tax system. That's what the red bars in particular are showing you. They're showing you the, the f initial four-year freeze to personal tax thresholds in, in income tax and in national insurance. It's raising something in the region of 35 billion pounds over the course of the next few years, particularly this year and next. I think the main thing I would point to on this is that by raising taxes through threshold freezes rather than increasing rates, the effect is that basically everybody from the middle to the top gets hit reasonably hard. So if you've done this via rates, it would look even more progressive and you would see that black line, which is showing you the the tax rises as a percentage of income, you would see it continuing to become more progressive. The top would be paying a lot. But because a millionaire basically will now pay the same tax increase as someone on 200k in this world, because it's being done through thresholds, you end up with this flatter profile, where basically government policy is taking 3% of, off the incomes of the top half of the population. That is the that is how we are becoming poorer by the government saying, OK, I'm going to cut some public services. so You get worse public services over here. And I'm going to raise taxes by around, as I say, 3% of income for the top half of the population. Now, then we're going to try to step back and try to do justice to a bigger picture argument about why is Britain in this state? Why does this feel so difficult? The, um, uh, and this may be unhelpful because basically my argument is you really didn't want to go into a cost of living crisis from where we are. And that's why people think social scientists aren't very constructive. So I will then move on to being more constructive. Uh, afterwards. So uh, my big argument is basically there are two things that are defining the political economy of modern Britain. The first is that we're a very unequal country and that we are still living with the high inequality that the 1980s gave us. This is one measure of inequality, the Gini coefficient. And it's basically, but a, almost any measure of inequality or indeed poverty I showed you would have broadly this shape, unless I started cutting it for different groups, but broadly the shape, which is that the increase is almost all during the 1980s and is almost all driven by the wage distribution uh, uh, pulling apart during that phase, alongside some tax cuts, particularly for those at the top. The, um, since then, it is basically broadly flat. You can see a small uptick in the hyper-globalization phase of the mid-2000s, where the top 1% was doing very well indeed. And you can see what happens when bankers get hammered in the financial crisis and the nine fell back down again starting. But the big picture is that the line has stayed broadly flat ever since. So we, are, we ha have been since the early 90s, and we are today the most unequal large country in Europe. The, um, now, some people, I think, think that the public really minded this happening in the 1980s. The, um, but I'm afraid the increase in worries about inequality, this may even be one of Bobby's charts from his ancient history, but uh, the public didn't really start worrying about inequality being high in Britain until the financial crisis. So it was not the rise in inequality that saw a rise in concerns about inequality. And the question is, why is that? And the second trend is that what, the second big feature that I'm going to come on to, I think, explains why it's not inequality per se that's driving concern with inequality. The, um, because in the 1980s, if you have a look at what was happening to household disposable incomes, they were growing very fast. There's a reason why Margaret Thatcher was winning elections despite some social scientists saying, isn't it bad that inequality has gone up? And the answer is because lots of people were getting better off those at the bottom weren't, but the pain was fairly concentrated in particularly some places. Uh, and so you saw election victory after election victory. Whereas since, uh, since in the last decade, 
we've seen much lower income growth. If I drew this same chart, but for wages, then it would say zero in the 2010s. The only reason we had any income growth in the 2010s was because employment was growing much stronger than we expected. And as I say, this is a household income chart. So it give, this has been kind to the last uh, decade. If I showed you productivity, it would show growth of 0.4% a year during that decade. So a complete catastrophe going on. Now, I think the really important thing that doesn't happen often enough is to overlay that high inequality with that low growth. And the two together, I would argue, is the problem for modern Britain. And here's one way of visualizing that. So this is showing you uh, trying to compare other countries, the similar groups. So in blue, uh, the poorest households, the P10, in red, the typical household, and in green, the top. And it's showing you the relative income of those groups in Britain versus their, well, sorry, in, other, in those countries versus their equivalents in Britain. Okay, so the first thing to say it is that it's only the top in Britain, which is green, who, where they are on a similar par to big European countries. The, um, so if you look, richer people in France are slightly poorer than their equivalents in Britain. That's why all the bankers kept moving to Balham in London and wherever else they moved right over the course of the last two decades. But in the Netherlands, the top are basically exactly the same income as in Britain. But because GDP per capita is much higher in the Netherlands of Germany, a bit higher in France, but much higher in the Netherlands and Germany. And because inequality is higher in all three, is lower in all three countries, those on middle and lower incomes get are completely stuffed. So again, let's start with France. The middle in France is 10% richer than the middle in the UK, but the poor are over 25% better off. You are much better. It's not 2%. I think, I think people think these are small numbers, but they are huge numbers. You are much, much better off to be poor in France than you are in the UK, and the same implies in Germany and the Netherlands. Now, there's differences between these countries. We've published lots of in, in detail digging into that. But the big picture, which is if you are a high inequality country with a low GDP per capita relative to what you think of as your comparator countries, then you do not want to be poor or middle income, because that is why you are being the combination of the two is really toxic. Indeed, as you can see, Italy has managed to, um, which is more equal than us, but is, has a lower GDP per capita it, it is not great either. The, um, but that's because Italy hasn't grown for 25 years. So that is what happens. Right. So why does this matter? I'm going to offer two things. Why does this toxic combination of not growing our economy, but sticking with the high inequality matter? So this is showing you the sh amount of people's household budgets that they spend on essentials. OK, and essentials for here um, uh, means food, fuel, clothing and transport. OK, so just focus on the poorest 20 percent. That's the top line. And it's saying in 2006, they spent about 52 percent of their income on essentials. But in 2019, as we went into the pandemic, which is the most recent data we kind of trust on this, um, we were heading, we were spending well over 58% of their, their income on essentials. So the people that are having their energy bills saw now don't have loads of non-essential spending to cut because they've been squeezed for the last decade. And if you can see that the richest are the group that hasn't seen that happening to the same extent, although even there, having slow growth is having some effect in terms of, and remember to think about this, it, like sometimes people say to me, oh, look, it doesn't matter if you have slow growth, you know, as long as we're all in it together and all the rest. But I'm afraid we live in a global economy. The stuff we're importing, the prices of that reflect the wages in other countries. We don't, we, you know, we don't get to determine the global price of gas. If anyone thought we did, I hope they've been unlearned that in the last year. So we need to produce things domestically to be able to pay for those things that we consume uh, from abroad. You'll have noticed we don't produce our own iPhones. So it doesn't, we can't wish our way out of what happens if we don't increase our productivity, but other countries do, then we can't consume as much. Yeah. Right. The second thing, which was hot topic last week, is why do you think we're seeing our tax rates go up, but we're getting worse public services? So that's another way. That's just another symbol of becoming poorer as a country. So this is just showing you as an illustration. I'm not saying these things are directly correlated before anyone gets excited. The, um, but this is showing you on the blue lines, NHS waiting lists like truly terrible numbers that I don't think, well, I definitely didn't think were possible. And then on the red line is the one that is upsetting Conservative MPs, which is heading to the highest tax to GDP ratio we've had since the Second World War, since 1948. And th th that is all part of this same big picture story. You get poorer as a country, it shows up in different ways, whether you can cope with a shock to your household incomes, whether you can afford the public services you want with a low enough tax burden that you also uh, want.
Right. So having done the short term crisis and then touched on the longer term underpinning of it, I just want to briefly have a reflection on how have we in the kind of so public policy engaged social science community, particularly those coming at it from an economics perspective, how have we done? And I'm afraid my answer is we have done pretty badly. Um, indeed, I, 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 there's some, I'm, I'm going, this is largely a focus on where we haven't done well. There are areas that we've done better. I think the public policy uh, community uh, did reasonably well during the pandemic in terms of swiftly focusing on changes that were necessary in economic policy, the furlough scheme, what was needed in terms of um, firm support, uh, encouraging support on poorer households during that time. So, and, and a focus on the labor market. I think there's lots of some things that have gone well. Similarly, during the energy crisis, I think there's been a lot of important analysis done. But taking a longer term lens, I think the picture is less rosy. And my argument is basically there's three things to focus on. In the 2000s, we were complacent. The, um, in the 2010s, and actually since, I think fatalism is far too widespread. There's a cartoon on the right to remind you why fatalism is a stupid idea in life, as well as in politics and policy making. And I think even those of people that aren't fatalistic, there's, there's, we are easily distracted as a research community into things that are interesting or kind of sat, feel like they are popular or um, important, but basically aren't material to the big questions facing the country. And I'm going to go through a few of those. So I'm going to take the charge sheet in turn. So first of all, on complacency. So uh, as Dr. Bobby said at the beginning, um, my kind of long ancient life involved starting a career in the UK Treasury in the 2000s. And uh, the first meeting when I remember people discussing uh, the slowdown in household living standards, which broadly started for working age population in 2003, was in 2009. So it was six years before anyone noticed, okay? Um, and this is just to go through why. So GDP per capita growing at quite strong rates during the 2000s. So people were looking at that and thinking, well, I'll take that. That's like, you know, stronger than lots of other countries. Uh, maybe not the peak we've ever seen, but it's pretty good. And Britain in general has had a pretty good 10 years at that point. If you were a, uh, you know, you're a bit of a lefty, you might have said, OK, but what we ultimately care about is living standards. So can I please see the chart for household incomes, not just for GDP per capita? No one did that, but had they done that, then they would have seen this bar, this like these bars, which would have shown you that okay, since two thousand and three, four median incomes weren't growing as fast as GDP per capita. They are um, significantly slower, but they were still, you know, decent. You know, they were still like so. There was some noticeable growth going on. There's only one year below one percent growth during that phase. Again, nobody was doing this, but were, if you were a complete communist and you really wanted to dig into the detail, you might have said, okay, I want to see what's happening to the working age population in particular. And if you'd done that, you would have seen that since 2003, four, you had only had one year with above 1% income growth. And no one noticed this slowdown happening, or actually, the, and underpinning this is a wage slowdown. That's what's doing the work here, mainly a wage. I mean, partly that the employment growth couldn't continue forever, but it was mainly the wage slowdown that was driving this. And no one noticed for an entire uh, you know, six years. That definitely is a sign of complacency and not not looking beneath the headlines when the headlines were flattering what was going on. And although I'm coming at that from the perspective of policymakers, it was not until the US literature started to highlight the slowdown in wages relative to productivity going back to 1979. And that started happening in the US in the, the like, second half of this period so the second half of the 2000s that the uk people start so even in uk academia people were not highlighting this trend either so this isn't just blaming the treasury i'm blaming all of us as social science for not noticing a second example of the same phenomenon which is a good which i think particularly illustrates the danger of averages is what happens on home ownership so the first time that home ownership returns to being a British public policy and political issue is in the mid 2000s. Those of you that are um, were paying attention then, there was big rows within the Labour Party about whether there was enough focus on housing as an issue. There were every Labour conference, it was like booted back off the agenda. In general, you know, that's when people start worrying. Now, the reason they started in 2005 is if you look at the black line, is that is when it's 2004 when you start seeing the average home ownership rate in this country falling. Yeah. But had we focused on young people, so just focus on the blue line, that started falling in 1989. 
yet no one noticed basically for 15 years. And again, I'm focusing on public policy makers, but you do not get the articles being written about the, ch the t change in home ownership. And, and, you know, at one level, it's not surprising. The average was going up. Older cohorts were enjoying the benefits of the house, house price appreciation, which was driving down home ownership amongst young people. And as you can see, home ownership rates amongst older cohorts actually carried on rising right through this phase. Even now, if you look at like 70 year olds, they're still inheriting some houses. So you're still seeing some people becoming homeowners later in life. So we didn't see the youth home ownership crisis coming either. Now, that's the 2010s. So that's the 2000s, basically not waking up to some of the big trends that are going on. If I think, back, if I think about the last decade, the 2010s, this is, this is a robot called Sir Killalot. For those of you of a particular generation, you may remember from a program called Robot Wars. Now, the most modern, whether or not you liked the original TV series version, the 2010s version of this is lots of people writing books saying the problem facing advanced economies is that the robots are going to take all our jobs. And you saw this, you know, the IMF, the OECD, uh, I'm not going to name the individual authors of best-selling books, but basically you could make a lot of money producing a book claiming that this was technology destroying jobs was the problem of the 2010s. Now, remember, that was happening at the same time as employment was reaching record highs and productivity was completely stagnating. And in Britain, since 2016, we had zero product, zero business investment growth at all. The, um, now, there's two issues here. One is the fatalism that, you know, we just got to panic, basically, that technology is going to come along and it's going to do all these bad things. The other thing that tended to sit alongside this argument was a referring back to the 1980s and saying, um, any economic change will be exactly like deindustrialization and it will cost loads of people their jobs and it will be incredibly geographically concentrated and cause lots of problems. The, um, now, people spent time writing these books. They then tended to have a chapter at the end of the book saying why this was a reason to have a UBI. The um, uh, entire like months of the Financial Times or like economic policy seminars right around the country were focused on discussing why the robots were going to kill every job and why you therefore needed a universal basic income immediately. Meanwhile, nobody wrote about how on earth we're going to get investment up, productivity up, and some wage growth into this economy, or any of the other really big challenges we were facing. Just to then illustrate why this was so dangerous and why I don't think we've done a great job of understanding 21st century Britain. So one thing that tended to come up in these robot discussions was change is really speeding up. You know, young people can't cope with it. Everyone's changing jobs all the time. The labor market's just changing all the time. And this is showing you a long-term time series of sectoral reallocation. The number of workers or the share of the workforce that are moving between different parts of the economy over time. So it's a measure of economic change. And I'm showing you three different measures because uh, there are, we can't do the full time series for the detailed industri industrial uh, classifications, but we can do for the broad uh, ones. And what you can see is that basically economic change in Britain has been slowing down since the 1980s. In fact, recent decades probably seen the lowest rates of economic change uh, since at least the 1930s. The, um, now, the uptick you can see at the end is the pandemic having quite a large effect on the hospitality and retail sector. So that's not a structural thing going on. The, um, now, that is the opposite of all our discussions. All our discussions are loads of jobs being destroyed, loads of that's the problem, we should really worry about that. If you look at this chart, you start to think, are we sure? Are we sure we shouldn't be worrying about not enough change happening in our economy, given that's one of the big sources of wage growth? Now, it doesn't mean all change is good. Lots of it can be very bad indeed. It doesn't mean that when we last dealt with big change in the 1980s, that we dealt with it remotely well. I think any reading of the literature or indeed the lived experience of that would tell you we didn't do a good job of adjusting to change well. But that is not today's uh, problem. Second example of this is people on the left in particular, but you get versions of them on the right as well saying, we don't care about GDP. We should, GDP growing shouldn't even be our objective anymore. And that could be for a degrowth argument because of green reasons, or it could be uh, because you think that if you get GDP growth, it's all captured by the top. And even in the last, I'm not going to name them, but even in the last three weeks, I've read articles by you know bright people saying um, GDP growth doesn't feed through into living standards anymore. That is not true in Britain. It's not true, and it's very, very dangerous to be saying it, because the reason wages haven't grown in the last 15 years is because our productivity has been disastrous. The, um, and this chart is showing you different ways of thinking about that. The red line is showing you growth over 
uh, the annualized growth rates over a decade for uh, GDP per capita. So that's showing you the slowdown in productivity. It would be even worse, again, if I did it as productivity rather than GDP per capita, because employment growth helps with GDP per capita. Then it's showing you that that has driven almost exactly the fall in wages, and that is what is driving the disposable income growth coming to a stop. So worrying about growth, sorry, worrying, saying we don't need growth exactly as we weren't getting any was not a good use of our time in the last decade. Last one is anxieties that we're having too much education and it's leading to, I'm giving these as examples but of distractions, but too much education and it's leading to people in poorer places having to move away from their home uh, and that, that is like the big problem facing our country. Well, this is showing you the percentage of young share of young people outward migrating from local authorities in 2019. Okay, and what it's showing you, focus on the purple line. This is what I call the Tunbridge Wells line. Okay, so the the 18 year olds that are leaving places are people living in rich places. Overwhelmingly, they are more than twice as likely to leave the place they live in. Like the feature of modern Britain is not that young people in deprived places end up leaving. It's that young people in deprived places stay put. And rich people in rich places are the ones that take up opportunities and move around. Yet huge amounts of time and effort is spent saying, what do we do to make sure more young people stay in Hull or Scarborough? Right there. Now, there's long term things we need to change about Hull in particular's economy and the opportunities that are offered there. But the idea that we think we've got too many people from Hull and Scarborough going to university and therefore moving away from their hometown, I'm afraid, does not remotely reflect the actual lived reality of our economy. And neither, by the way, I, I hear that in university seminars, I hear it from politicians. When we do focus groups, which we did a big set of recently, in specifically Hull, Scarborough, Barnsley, that is not what people say they want. They're not saying what I really want is fewer young people getting good opportunities here. By they, They're more asking the question, why doesn't Britain offer young people here more opportunities in general? They, um, Right, lastly on this section, which is one of the big distractions is that because things have got grim, people are have an eye out for an easy answer, a one answer that makes us all go away. And in the social science world, lots of people would scoff at uh, Brexiteers saying leaving the EU was the silver bullet to solving our economic worries, which is obviously what the flag here is representing. But I have to say, in lots of social science, I see similar versions of silver bullet or silver lining arguments that are too dominant. So I'll give you two examples here. During the COVID crisis, I read lots of pieces from people saying, oh, look, people are going to work from home in future, in brackets. They always forget that, you know, well over half the population never worked from home. But anyway, people are going to work from home in future, and that's going to solve all of our economic geography problems. Everyone's going to live in Rotherham and work in, uh, hold down a job in London, and that's going to solve the big economic geography problems facing the country. And I'm afraid, and people wrote that for a good 18 months until the economy reopened. And I'm afraid not a single iota of that is going on. So that, but that was because we were holding out for a silver lining. Well, I'm afraid the pandemic has just made us poorer as a country, and in lots of cases, sicker. The second example on the right hand side is the general focus, particularly on in some bits of academia on the idea that the only bit of economic strategy you need these days is a green economic strategy. Now, I'm being slightly provocative here, but and every, every version of Britain's economic strategy should have green at its core because we need to save the planet and we want Britain to be part of the answer to that. And that requires a sustainable economy sticking to its targets to deliver net zero and doing it in a way that maximizes the growth opportunities that come from that. But it is a tiny part of what will actually drive prosperity in Britain in the coming decades mainly because the main effect of the net zero transition in the next decade is an investor save project. We're going to have the same level of GDP, more or less. Ignore the skeptics that say it's going to cut GDP loads. And I'm afraid also ignore the people who say somehow the net zero transition is going to hugely boost GDP. Instead, what it's going to do is cut our consumption levels and increase our investment levels as a country as we build the infrastructure and, and make our homes vaguely energy efficient. That's what we need to be uh, doing. And so if we all we focus on, which again, I see from some bits of academia and some bits of social sciences on the green agenda, then I'm afraid we're not going to raise the living standards of millions of people. Then to begin to uh, wrap up, I'm going to get optimistic, I promise, to wrap us up. So first thing is policy makes a difference. So I'm giving you one example here. This is wage growth over the last 20 years from the lowest earners on the left to the highest earners on the right. And despite what everyone says, the truth is 
hourly wages have been very progressive right across this period, twice the growth at the bottom as we saw in the middle, and that is because of the minimum wage. It's because the minimum wage has given year after year after year above average wage growth to the bottom, and this has seen the first fall in low pay for four decades. We're probably heading back to 1970 levels of low pay right now. So complete policy triumph, and it hasn't had any of the employment effects people um, said. Then a macro case for optimism. So here is Britain on a grid of inequality on the uh, x-axis and uh, average income, average disposable income on the y-axis. Okay, so you can see lots of countries richer than us. Now, a lot of the discussion says, why can't we be as uh, high productivity as the United States? As you can see, they're hugely product productive or as equal as Norway. Look how great they are. You know, I like their fjords as well, right? My argument today was we don't need to become like the United States or like Norway. And neither is it plausible we're going to become like them in the foreseeable future. But we could become like, more like some countries which are richer than us and more equal than us. The, um, and I've given highlighted five here because they're five countries. Look, they include some Anglo-Saxon economies, Canada, Australia, um, some Northern European economies, the Netherlands, Germany and France. These are countries I think that most British people think we actually are quite like, uh, but we are not enough like them anymore. Now, if we could become like the average of those five countries, it would be completely transformational for living standards in Britain. So this is what this last chart is trying to illustrate for you. So if 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 you had the same average income levels, so leave leave our inequality as it is, but had the same income levels as those five countries on average, we would be 20% richer, which is a way of saying on average, they've got 20% higher disposable income. Again, highlight, not 2%, 20%, it's big. The second set of lines, and that's showing you again, but poorest families on the left, middle income families on the in blue, and uh, rich families in uh, in uh, in green. In the middle, it's showing you what would happen if we kept our current GDP per capita, but just became the same average inequality as those countries, which would be bad for the top, but it would still be pretty transformational for the bottom. So even if we didn't get richer, we just became more equal, you'd transform the living standards of those on lower incomes in Britain. And the right-hand side is showing you what would happen if we became as equal as those five economies and as rich as them. And the numbers are they're, they're, they're so staggering. When the team first showed me this, I told them to go away and do it again because they're so large, you almost can't believe it. But just to put this into numbers, that blue bar on the right hand side is saying to you that if Britain had the inequality of the average inequality of those countries, not the best, the average, and the average inequality and the average GDP per capita, then the average, the typical household in Britain would be £8,800 better off. In context, that 8,800 would make a big difference to paying an energy bill that's gone up by 1,500 pounds, right? That is, that is what we should be aiming to do. And we don't need to believe that uh, technology is suddenly going to really boost our economy because we know those other countries have, can do it. And we don't have to believe that we're going to become a socialist nirvana because those other countries, including Anglo-Saxon labour markets and economies, have been able to deliver an inequality level that is lower than ours. So some concluding thoughts. Obviously, right now, the urgent crisis is our focus, and it should be. And that's rightly why lots of us have spent all of the last year working on the short term cost of living crisis. But the reason it is so difficult is because it comes on top of this chronic longer term living standards crisis. As social scientists and policymakers, I think we have been slow at seeing the problems emerge. And then possibly even more damning, I think we are too often distracted in addressing them by focusing on other things that seem interesting at the time, like robots taking all of our jobs. The, um, the, the, my slightly po-faced reason this all matters is because in modern advanced economies where traditional hierarchies for good reasons are less important than they were, then it is the shared prosperity, the offer of shared prosperity, the offer of things getting better for the next generation that drives a lot of our social contract. That's the like, that is the offer to the next generation. It's the offer to why we are, need to be, how we are socially uh, cohesive. And its absence, which has now been the case for at least 15 years or longer, is a, it does can put you into a problem of bad economics leading to bad politics, leading back to bad economics. And you don't automatically get out of those doom loops. Italy shows you that. America may or may not show us that in the coming days. And that can be very dangerous for your democracy, not just for your economy. So then what do we do? 
well, we need to put stop being complacent, which I think we broadly have now, having lived through the last 15 years, but we equally need to stop being distracted or stop telling ourselves that things that are important but aren't big enough to plausibly solve this problem for us can't be our only focus. And instead, we need to be laser-like focused on, we have to get growth up, that's the Liz Trust bit, and we have to get inequality down, which maybe that's the Jeremy Corbyn bit. So you need both if you're going to have a successful 21st century economy. So I shall wrap up there. Well, <clears throat> that was just masterful. Thank you, Torso. So such a pleasure to be able to see it all together uh, like that in one place and, and building to such a clear narrative and 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 then some really worthwhile challenges for social scientists and, and policy makers. So I'm, I'm going to hand uh, straight over to Shreya just with a quick reminder to the audience to put their questions in the Q and A. There are some some coming in now. Do do look put in your own questions, upvote others, and then we'll get on to those after we hear from uh, Shreya and Aaron. Shreya, please. Um, great, thanks. Hi, um, thanks very much for having me, and uh, thank you, Torsten, for that very interesting lecture. Um, yeah, I've definitely agreed with lots of the points you made, um, particularly the complaint, your point about the complacency and the fatalism of the last two decades and how those are lessons that we need to learn from as social scientists and people who work on policy. Um, I think that, yeah, there's an interesting question there in terms of not just that that happened, but why it happened, why we made those mistakes and how we can learn from them to stop repeating them in the future. And what, yeah, what not just thinking about how we can fix the challenges that are, that are now in front of us, but what are the challenges that we perhaps might be missing now that people are going to be looking back in, in 10, 20, 30 years time and saying, oh, why didn't people in the 2020s think more about X issue? Not that I know what the answer to that is, but I think it's definitely worth thinking more about. Um, so yeah, just wanted to pick up on um, a few of the particular points you made and then just some points about the wider debate. So um, yeah, I thought your point about um, people moving away from their areas was really interesting and, and gets right to the heart of the debate about economic geography and levelling up. Um, it, um, yeah, I think it's it's a really interesting point, that you, the one that you make from your focus group research, that perhaps the our current understanding of what the public wants on levelling up isn't quite accurate. Um, I do, I mean, my perception from following the political debate has been that there is public appetite for, to some extent, for the government doing stuff to reduce regional inequalities and make sure that opportunity is more fairly spread around the country. So I think there is possibly still a question there about how exactly we reconcile those different arguments, but certainly a really interesting question. Um, on the point about public spending and um, worse public services for higher taxes, there's just something that still puzzles me there a bit in terms of the fact that Obviously, in some cases, we're seeing not just relative but absolute declines in the in the quality of public services delivered, and it's squaring that with the story about the UK's relative economic decline and mm -hmm. and you know low growth but not absolute decline in our economy and how how we square those two things like quite what is going on in terms of why public it's becoming harder to fund our public services is it just a question of growing need but not a growing economy. Um, or is there some absolute decline in our economy that we're not quite measuring? Or is, it, is there something else that's going on? Um, and and your, on your point about inequality, um, I think that that's really interesting. Um, I think perhaps there's something else to be unpackaged there about the link between um, like inequality in terms, in terms of how we measure it, in terms of income and wealth, but also what's happening on the credit side of the economy, because obviously credit can be used as a way of papering over the cracks and disguising mm -hmm. that increase in inequality but then when that when lending falls as it did after the financial crisis perhaps measured inequality doesn't rise but people's experience of inequality might have risen so that might also be driving some of the relationship that you describe um, and then on the wider debate I think there's an underlying point question about can we actually afford to do anything about these problems or you know is it just that we're all poorer now and we just need to be fatalistic about it and obviously your conclusion was that we shouldn't be fatalistic and we can solve these problems and I completely agree um we need to be optimistic um but yeah I think that there's there's been a really interesting media debate around that um and in particular a bit of a disconnect between where I think economists and social scientists are on some of these questions and where the media and political debate is on questions like 
um, austerity and more recently the fiscal rules that the chancellor has been following um and that yeah that brings me to the point i wanted to make that i think much of these questions are like uh, ch changing that isn't about just te technically understanding better and those aren't technical questions they're also political questions like obviously we all know this but i think it's just worth reflecting on um and then in particular i wanted to say on the point about can we do anything about it um I just wanted to mention how the housing market, which you obviously said a lot about, and the role it plays in the economy. So I think I'm right in saying that housing is still the single biggest item of expenditure for households, despite energy bills more than doubling. Um, but unlike lots of other goods in the economy, housing is lots of those payments are detached from the real economy. They're better thought of as transfers from the sellers and owners of housing to the buyers and renters of housing. And I think in particular there, we can see that that's primarily a political question who pays for housing and how much they're paying um, and that's something that's much more in the government's control to shape and so that in particular gives me a lot of optimism about how we how the government does have a lot of power to change to, to improve living standards and improve society even despite the fact that yes we are facing this energy crisis and yes we're poorer so yeah that was the points I wanted to make thanks really good thank you Great to broaden that out um might, if you don't mind, Torsten, if you just hold mm -hmm. thoughts and responses and in mind, we'll go straight over to Aaron and that will give me a chance to organise the Q&A as well. Um, yeah, Aaron, over to you. Brilliant. Uh, thanks very much. Uh, and thanks, uh, Torsten, for the lecture and, and Trey for the initial comments. So since you picked up some of the things that I, I would have said, I will uh, pick out um, kind of two, two key parts to the challenge that Torsten set at the end, which is a challenge of getting growth up while getting inequality down. Um, and so I don't want to get into all of the, you know, as I think Torsten laid out quite clearly, this is not an area in which there's going to be any single silver bullet. So I'm not going to say, you know, this is the one thing we ought to do and everything will be fixed. That's clearly not right. Instead, I'll just pick out a couple of areas uh, that I find interesting. And in particular, I don't want to get deep into the policy weeds, uh, although I'd love to do that. Um, I actually wanted to talk a bit more about uh, the role of the social sciences in both of those areas. Um, so I think in the first, the, the kind of two areas I wanted to pick up on were, were tax, which is sort of obvious if anyone has ever spoken to me before, I, I, I love tax, um, and also skills. Um, and they interact with each other. I mean, tax has a very direct impact depending on how we choose to raise it on inequality. And it raises the money that you can use uh, to increase and improve skills provision. And in the long term, improving skills provision is going to be part of, you know, as Torsten laid out, again, labor productivity in the UK, that is the amount of yeah. output that's produced, the amount of valuable stuff that's produced for every hour that somebody works in the UK has not been rising. And it is in the level of it, the level is lower than in comparable countries. And a big part of that is the fact that we are not providing for a lot of people high quality enough skills or the right set of skills, the right combination of skills that allow them to get paid more for every hour they work. And that would be good for them, both because they could get more money in total and because potentially for some people who work variable hours, they may wish to work fewer hours, but have the same amount of income. So there's a really important challenge for us to tackle. Um, so I don't want to get in, as I say, I'm not going to get into, here's my exact policy solution in these areas, or I have some, have some thoughts in that area. But I think the kind of key thing that I wanted to, to flag on the, on the side of uh, skills provision is it's become an even more important challenge because we're no longer as able as, as we used to be until recently to kind of solve it by basically importing skills, by bringing people to the UK. You know, both because we've trashed the pound, so it's not as exciting to come and move to the UK uh, and work here as it used to be, because the money's not as good, and because we've basically been being fairly mean to foreign people. Uh, it's not it's not as nice an environment uh, to come into. And um, so that's that's you know one part of it. It's just it's harder to get here, and it's not as nice to be here. But also you know because we've been shutting down, literally uh, you know making visas harder to get, that that route has become less available. Um, and so those that that means that skills policy is going to be even more important. So the thing then to say in terms of where do we as social scientists come in is that actually government policy in this area has been a complete disaster because they keep opening and closing new commissions or new ways of doing things. There's the Industrial Strategy Council that was briefly partly thinking about skills alongside investment policy. That was shuttered. They created the Skills and Productivity Board. That lasted 15 months and was closed down. There have been, you know, before, that's just the last, you know, three years. But before that, there have been iterations of different uh, kind of policy boards or things that have been created to look at this area. And so I think that's the kind of area where, I mean, there are specific organizations that are trying to do things on this, but it's the kind of area where something like the Academy, which yeah. has its own you know, policy themes, but might want to bring together a kind of background version of that same kind of object 
So that there's a group of people working across the different areas, uh, but to look at skills policy and education policy that then can't be shut down by government is already there doing the thinking, producing stuff on a consistent basis. I, I know there are things that the, the academy puts out, but putting out something that's kind of more regular and consistent, it, there may be a role for you know, a collective group of social scientists to be working on that uh, in a way that's focused on, on the policy angle rather than only on the, only on the um, kind of, you know, a lot of us working in the academic sphere and then separately there being people uh, in, the, in the policy sphere, having kind of bringing those people together would be valuable. Then on the on the, the second thing on, on taxation, I mean, for me, you know, capital taxation is one of the big areas I work on taxation of, of wealth and taxation at the top end. Uh, those are areas that have been an uh, important challenge uh, in, in you know, the past few decades. So it was a big move since the 80s when, when Torsten you know, showed us that big rise in inequality. Uh, there was a big move away from the taxation of capital. Uh, and so, for example, there used to be a, a, a tax that was specifically on income that's from capital that was removed. And that's important because in the same time, as we started reducing the tax on capital, we actually increased the tax on work. So we've added, you know, national insurance has been, you know, the favorite stealth tax. We talk about stealth taxes in terms of freezing thresholds, but actually one of the taxes that politicians have loved to raise over time is that national insurance because, it, you know, it sounds nice. We know people feel fairly positively towards it, but actually it's just a tax specifically on work and makes work much less uh, kind of lucrative relative to uh, getting an income from wealth. And so taxation policy in this area has been uh, quite a failing. And so there's specific things to do in that kind of the, the taxation of capital that affects most people, but there are also things particularly to do about tax at the top end, so tax of, of the wealthiest people. And it's an area where I've done uh, you know, a reasonable amount of work looking specifically at, from an economist's point of view, what happens if you were to increase taxes at the top? Uh, what does that do in terms of the tax take? What does that do in terms of economic outcomes? And you know, how much do people respond to those things? And one of our findings recently was that actually if you, for, for, the, for a group of people who are called non-doms, if you were to increase taxes on them quite substantially and make them pay the same amount of tax as everybody else, they really don't leave very much. And so we found that and we thought, okay, that's interesting. And of course the challenge we get is everybody expects that's not true. Everyone thinks that, every, that these very wealthy people are going to leave. And one way to kind of tackle that challenge, because we literally see all of the people, we don't know anyone's name, but we literally see everybody in the country and we see that these kind of reforms don't lead to people, or well, that reform specifically didn't lead to lots of people leaving. One way to answer that challenge is to have other social scientists also working, you know, there are people who are much better than I am, who are able to talk, you know, do, do the kind of qualitative methods that try to understand, well, okay, where is it that people in the policy sphere get their ideas from, or the newspapers get their ideas from about everybody leaving? What is it that actually determines rich people's decisions of whether to stay in the UK or not. I mean, obviously I can look at stuff numerically, but having people who go out and do these kind of interviews, try to talk to them, try to understand what are the things that make them make a decision about being in the UK. Those are all things that other parts of social scientists can, can kind of provide that help fit this policy agenda together, where it's not just the economists saying, here's what we can observe by going and do some numerical stuff, but having the other social sciences kind of contribute to that to help us understand better what is actually going on. And how do we also then convey that material to policymakers? to help them uh, kind of absorb that information, use that information effectively. So I'll stop there because I think there's lots of questions to ask, but I just wanted to pick out a couple of, a couple of areas that I thought were interesting to, to follow on. Brilliant. Yeah, really useful. Thank you, Aaron. And again, great challenges back to the social science community. But Torsten, do you have reflections on Sorry. those points? Um, yeah. uh, there's loads of great points there, there are some of which I need to go away and think about. Because um, I definitely can't, I don't have the answers to them. So. Um, so on a few of Shreya's, so um, on why I don't have the definitive answer on why we didn't notice, um, but I'll offer you two thoughts. Uh, I mean, I called it complacency for a reason, which is, you know, we thought things were going well. You know, we thought things were going well. Britain had been in a catch-up phase with the US, Germany and France for uh, a good 10 years. Um, and the GDP numbers seem to suggest that. Uh, the tax receipts were okay, um, and so you didn't look. You weren't looking for pro you weren't looking to explain a problem because it wasn't there in the headlines, basically. So that is a, that's just like you know. And if I'm honest, I think economics didn't focus enough on living standards. It focused on big macro variables. It wasn't focused on what was actually happening to households. Data wasn't as good, to be fair. But even so, it wasn't like you know there wasn't a resolution foundation whose only job was to spend every day looking at different ways of looking at household living standards data was less available outside of 
you know, I mean, if we're honest, like, you know, the world has changed dramatically in the last 20 years in terms of people working on public policies, access to data, and their ability to use it well. So I think that's my, my second one, which I'm more confident about is, and this is definitely true on the housing side of things, is a combination of statistics and power. So on statistics, it's averaging is very dangerous. And on averaging on house prices, that uh, average on home ownership rates, I'm afraid once the, while the average home ownership rate was still going up, nobody, the powers that be were not going to panic about falling home ownership, basically. <laughs> the, um, and, and then the second thing is, uh, you know, the housing market, like all markets, has power dynamics in it. And richer people and older people were doing very, very well. So why was anyone going to start panicking? Um, uh, oh, so those are my two. I think those two are definitely big parts of it. But they're definitely not enough to explain uh, all of it. The, um, in terms of your, I thought your, one of your last questions on what's our balance between fake, like this stuff's happening to us, we can't do anything about it, and how much do we have agency? My view is um, we've got to be really, we've got to distinguish. So on the short term uh, cost of living crisis, our level of agency at the level of how much is the country as a whole being made poorer is low. The, um, we are being like we don't control European gas markets. That is what, and insofar as we could have made any difference to it, we'd have had to be getting ourselves off gas production uh, a while ago or reforming our energy market. So in the short term, I don't think we have lots of agency in the levels effect on the country as a whole. We have a, a lot of agency about who bears that pain, when they bear it, and in which way. And that's clearly what public policy. That is the job of public policy in the heat of a cost of living crisis that's driven by a terms of trade shock like this. The, um, and that then feeds through to, in, insofar as how deep the recession is, we can do public policy better or worse during that phase. But it is mainly to do with how bad the how bad the energy price shock is, and that's going to put most of Europe into a recession in the coming months. It, it looks like not quite as bad as we feared. Maybe it turns out German industry is better at operating without. Um, Russian gas than maybe people thought, but still, it's going to be bad. I think within within that, though, obviously, Britain has got a huge amount of agency over almost everything else I discussed, whether it's productivity, whether it's housing skills, the lot. We have huge amounts of agency, um, and I think we underestimate that lot. Now, there's political constraints to that, and there are clearly Britain exists in a global economy, and despite that being forgotten by lots of our public policy discussion we can't wish those constraints away but we more broadly i think we have a lot of agency and most of everything else we've got wrong in the recent past we did have agency uh, over so i think this particular bit is an exception and then just lastly on your housing point i totally agree and i didn't have time to show it to you but although inequality overall hasn't is not materially been shifting i mean people like me are very interested in the shifts over the last two decades so i don't want to play it down okay we spend our lives working on it but the big picture isn't for big changes but if you look at the effect of housing over that phase uh it's really noticeable how housing cost differentials are have been pushing up on inequality basically because richer households got cheaper mortgages and poorer households it's not that private rents actually always rose as fast as some people say it's that the compositional shift into private renting is so large that it's been pushing up uh, housing costs for poorer households, plus housing benefit cuts have been catastrophic for poorer households. So housing, I totally agree, we've definitely got a lot of choice. Um, and then just briefly on Aaron's points, because I'm conscious we need to get some questions in, but the, um, uh, on, first of all, I should say, we, we all love all the work Aaron is doing on capital taxes, so long may it continue there. And actually looking back at the autumn, if you want some good news out of the autumn statement last week, we saw very good movements on reducing the allowances for CGT and dividends, um, which I um, was definitely moved quicker. I thought we were going to get there over the course of the next few years. We've got there a lot quicker, which is what a uh, public finances deterioration does for you. The, um, but that is really important in terms of, um, you know, we don't need to go to grand theories of like a perfect wealth tax to make a lot of progress. And this is like a good example of where we have made um, big progress. Um, on our just to make sure we don't agree on everything, I am a bit of a Marxist, only in the sense that, uh, in general, in British public policy, particularly um, the social sciences, I do. I, my personal view is I think there's actually a bit too much focus on narrative driving outcomes, and I'm afraid I'm generally in the it is the economics it's the economic superstructure driving the outcomes. So I'll give you an example on the on the. A lot of people think, oh, after, you know, in the 2010 econ economy debate about big fiscal debates, then the public was tricked by the evil narratives of George Osborne and or 
the newspapers into wanting public spending cuts. Uh, I think people that think that didn't spend enough time with the British public in 2009 and 2010, who definitely, without needing being persuaded, thought, and in fact, actually, the British public, if you look in the, if you spoke to, you did focus groups with the British public during the pandemic, when all economists, the world's now changed, but then all economists thought there weren't big financial, there weren't fiscal constraints, and we didn't need to pay back the pandemic debt. Uh, I'm afraid the public was not of that uh, that view. The, um, and then secondly, on, I mean, and they're thinking that, for, I, I just don't think they're idiots, is my main point. And then um, uh, I see similar things on some of the migration discussion where people think, oh, if we just told the public, if the public saw my chart, then they would suddenly agree with me. And I basically think that is not how the world uh, substantially works on um, on uh, on the skill, and I, agree, I basically agree with everything Aaron said on like skills policy. In the long run, the idea that in a service economy, which is what we are, despite what everybody wants to write, um, the idea that we need less education rather than more is like a mad way to try and make us a rich country in the twenty first century. Excellent, thank you. So I'm going to. There are three questions that kind of got the top votes, and what I'd like to do is just tell you them all, all three at once, and okay. then uh, Shreya and Aaron, if there's anything that you'd like to come in with first, but then I'll give final words to Torsten on it. So the, the three that come out, three th sort of themes is, how much will Brexit affect the changes you described in the years to come? It's more forward-looking, I think, than backward-looking. Uh, uh, and that's from Joseph Nisnik. And then Alex Platt is asking, yes, I get that growth is important, but what about the limits of growth in terms of environmental concerns? Um, surely what kind of growth is important, which seems like a, an important one. And then a final one on productivity people from Richard Fernandez saying uh, people have been concerned about the productivity crisis for decades. Do you think there's anything different now to help us find an answer? So um, Brexit. Um, uh, more sustainable growth and productivity crisis. What is what is actually the answer? Just come to Shreya and Aaron just to see if you've got any quick uh, thoughts on that before we give final words to Torsten and Katie if you've got anything. But uh, Aaron and Shreya for you first. Shreya, anything to? Um, yeah, I mean questions. Um... Yeah, big questions on on the growth and environment point. Um, yeah, totally agree. What kind of growth is important? But I, yeah, I guess I just say that I think having growth is is completely compatible with doing good policy on the environment. And in fact, it's probably necessary. Like having rising living standards is probably necessary if you want people to vote for the kinds of policies that we need to see on the environment. Um, and you know, things like technological change that will allow us to use energy more efficiently. Or, um, switch to more renewable resources are also sources of economic growth um on the productivity crisis i'd just say that i like i'd go back probably go back to what i was uh, yeah what i was saying about the politics of it and say that i think part of what's changed is just the politics of it have changed mm -hmm. and so people are going to be like that you know you can just see already in the debate there's so much more attention now on these questions of growth and how do we increase productivity and we can't afford to keep going on like this because the public service is deteriorating so i think the ground will be right for somebody to to push through changes that would have been unpopular before um and then sorry was the was the final question on brexit yeah um i mean i i don't have much to say that i mean i probably go back to the point i was making about how lots of this is political questions right. not just technical yeah. questions and very good about that as well. great thanks for it aaron any quick uh thoughts? not a lot to disagree with there uh just to say a bit further on brexit since so that's the one that was punted a bit um that i mean just in terms of the even the areas that i picked up earlier uh, i mean one it's making migration harder. That is going to be a thing that means that even more we're going to have to work out how do we deal with the fact that if we're, going to make, if we're not going to make migration easy, we're going to have to deal with all the challenges that creates for us by actually having workers ourselves who are able to do those things and have the skills for them. It's also going to make us poorer. That means we're going to have to work out even more how we're going to raise tax to do some of the things that we need to do. Um, so that's sort of the challenge there. Um, on the on the question, sorry, on the, on the question of um, the nothing to add on what Shreya said in terms of growth uh, mm. on this kind of broader question of uh, productivity I think the other thing to to add on this point about productivity crisis I think where I would maybe disagree with, with Shreya is sure it's been going as a crisis that's been going on for a long time I'm sure that means that there ought to be pressure to fix it I don't know that that's going to make it work I think that I had, I had a similar feeling ahead of the budget this time around which was or the autumn statement which was finances public finances are in a mess 
this is a once in a sort of generation opportunity to do something big because everyone agrees it's a mess. We've all decided it's a mess. We all saw the mini statement thing that was a disaster. This is the chance for someone to announce something big that actually makes the system better. And what we saw was a bunch of politicians decide to kind of play it timid and not do very much and go, well, okay, let's, let's do things that are not stupid, but fundamentally in five years time, we're going to be asking the same questions because the energy profits thing is going to go away. So they're not, that's 8 billion pounds that's just knocked off. We're already balancing the books on the basis that we're going to somehow cut public services in the future that we no one believes is true. So we, we deferred all the hard decisions. I'm not convinced that just because productivity is a big problem now, that's enough. The only part, I agree with you, the politics is important. I may be more pessimistic that the politics are going to just fix themselves. Yeah. But I don't know what Torsten thinks. Yeah, Torsten. Well, I don't know. Aaron's got us all down now by predicting a, 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 an economics politics doom loop. Uh, <laughs> so we mustn't become Italy um, right now without the weather or the pizza, um, which is not what we want. So... Um, so, um, to part to try to do justice to those what's are really good questions and you know all need hours to discuss on their own so on brexit i i think in terms of what we can see in the data in terms of what we should confidently feel like is going on we've got i'd, I'd put the effect so far into three buckets um an immediate wage squeeze which was basically sterling depreciated in, in inflation was higher than it otherwise would have been because of higher import costs pushing down real wages so wages straight away investment growth dying in 2016 not fdi by the way everyone predicted fdi dying that is not what's happened fdi in fact is pretty held up pretty well actually not what i expected uh, but business investment in general totally flat i mean obviously crashing during the pandemic but british business Brit invest business investment across the piece in almost every sector since 2016 is a disaster um and is and is our long term one of our key long term drivers of that productivity problem. And I mean, it's just it's really really seriously bad. Um, then the more recent thing, because remember the TCA only came into effect in January twenty. Um, uh, so there, there I'd say the what we should feel we sh basically the predictions weren't quite right. The predictions were very focused on exports to the EU falling. Um, and instead, what has happened is that basically it, the predictions weren't right, but the, the reality is worse than that, which is our level of trade openness with almost everybody has fallen. So Britain, we are in, we're importing less from almost everywhere and exporting less, the, um, including you know, countries that have got nothing to do with the EU, so like Japan, the US. So we're becoming, in general, a less open economy. The, um, and that is a very big problem because one of the big long-term drivers of rising living standards, I'm afraid, is uh, is specialization and comparative advantage. And without you don't need to believe in like the ludicrous simple models of that from the 19th century to think that, you know, I mean, uh, somewhat, uh, does anyone remember the, do you remember the story about Argentina trying to uh, grow their own blackberries? Everyone remember this? Not, nothing? Okay, go and Google Argentina's experience of being like, we've really got to do mobile phone production in Argentina. And it involves, the highlights involve deciding that the person, people to do that are BlackBerry in 2009, when Blackberries were about to die, and then ending up putting tariffs on all mobile phones apart from Blackberries because you've got this bloody Blackberry plant that you've got to flog, and they cost on our, I think the unit cost was thousands of pounds per unit to production. So I, I don't want to, again, be uh, too purist about it. There's lots of sides to trade that are more complicated, but it being a much less open economy is going to cost us. In terms of its other long-term effects, our modeling work with LSE I'm afraid points to it doesn't make much difference to the manufacturing service split in the economy, which some people, including quite thoughtful people like Martin Sambu, wrote out as one of the possible plus sides of the nature of the Brexit we have done. Instead, what it does is within the manufacturing sectors, move us away from the higher value added integrated supply chain bit of the world, electronics, uh, and move us more into the food manufacturing uh, low productivity part of the world. The, um, so I'm, I, that, that was obviously in, the basically worsening the like long term trends I've been talking about in general. On growth and limits to growth, I mean, obviously the question is entirely right. So there are very serious limits to the, our growth. The, um, we obviously just, that should just be an absolute constraint on the way in which we go about doing things. Um, my own, to like, have a bit of optimism as we come towards the end of this great session, which is, that is less of an acute challenge on the production side in the UK than it is in some other countries. So I would much rather be the UK, big service economy, mostly industrialization has happened. So the impact of uh, 
moving away, moving towards net zero on our production is actually not that significant. There's a few places where it is really significant. You'll have seen Port Talbot in the news a lot. But generally, once we've decarbonized our electricity generation sector, we don't have a huge industrial problem. What we have on the net zero, what we have, the, the, our challenge on the net zero side is a consumption challenge. How do we how do we decarbonize our homes and our cars in a way that doesn't cause a living standards disaster for people? And it will and it will require some lower consumption in the years ahead. And that is where we should be focused on the productivity crisis. So again, we should just distinguish between different productivity crises. So there's a productivity puzzle, which is why has Britain's productivity fallen more more than other countries post financial crisis? There are the social scientists. My actual basic view is social science should now stop doing work trying to understand the drivers of the productivity puzzle because we've now got papers that it's like overdetermined about 20 times on the basis of all the research I've seen like we've just got to focus on what we do about it like what are the don't like we've got and then when you focus on what you do about it I think that will then push you to focus on the longer term issue which is Britain's low productivity which as the question indicates predates the financial crisis quite significantly and when you're doing that you I think you will come to focus on uh, lack of public and private investment as like a complete in the end if we don't invest in our future by our companies or our state then you are not going to be a high living standards economy in the future and we're just gonna have to suck that up and that involves tough choices but everyone saying they want more investment needs to understand it means lower consumption today or more borrowing from abroad which we can't really do so it basically means lower consumption it's time to like that's what we have to do and then lastly i'd say there are good and bad ways to higher productivity growth that i have probably changed my mind on in the last 20 years and in one in particular which is I, I, if you'd asked me 10 years ago, I would have said, I want productivity up in some of our lower paying service sectors, right? Uh, and people say this all the time. Uh, Rachel Reeves talks about the everyday economy. I think like you see, lot, I hear lots of that. I've now done enough focus groups with low wage workers in those sectors to make me think, if you look at their job satisfaction, they're the only group whose job satisfaction has come down since the 1990s. And they're the group that's seen the highest pay rises. Right. So we've been giving them more money and their job satisfaction is down, their stress is up. And so my basic view is I, mm -hmm. I would think long and hard about focus. I wouldn't focus a productivity growing uh, strategy on those sectors. I would instead focus, I'm afraid, on the high value added sectors, which we need to grow. And I'll end there, Bobby. That was brilliant. Thank you. Thank you so much. Um, thank you, everyone, for that really great discussion. And just about got in on time despite covering a huge huge range of things but we do have to leave it there so before my final thanks um please do visit the website um excellent program of analysis uh, on those links that we sent and many more events and other things coming up so do keep in touch follow the campaign the academy uh, steve's going to add the addresses um for that and do get in touch if you want to get involved so um, just from me, a very final thanks to everyone for coming uh, to this fascinating session, uh, to Sage uh, Publishing for their, their excellent support and sponsorship of all of these things, to Steve Grundy who, um, and Chris at Sage for organising the event, and of course to Shreya and Aaron for brilliant responses, and of course mainly to Torsten for a really insightful, masterful session. Thank you, Torsten. Thank you for the invitation. Thanks for having us. Thank thanks, you. everyone. Bye. Bye.